Kunal Bell and Rohit Bansal, founders of Snapdeal, are among the pioneers in the e-commerce business. In fact, as investors, they also have a ringside view of the flourishing startup ecosystem. Today, we talk to them about their experience as founders, what it takes to build a company. And of course, we try and understand a thing or two from their lens as founders about what makes for a good investment in the startup ecosystem. This is Forbes India Pathbreakers. I am Neha Bodhra. Kunal, Rohit, thank you so much for joining us on Pathbreakers. You were, I think, just out of college uh, when Snapdeal happened. So tell me a bit about how the idea came about. You were pioneers in the e-commerce space at that point. Firstly, thank you, Neha. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure being here uh, with you on, uh, on Pathbreakers. You know, we're, we went to school together, Rohit and I. So we're just the best of friends for now 25 years. We just wanted to start a company so that we can hang out with each other. <laughs> Maybe four or five months after we had graduated, it's when we started, sort of started this discussion that he asked me, Surohit, kya plan hai? And I was like, you know, I'll go do my MBA and then maybe we can come back and start a business. And he was like, you know, eventually if you have to do the same thing, why waste all this time? Let's do it now. So that's how, that's how we ended up uh, pulling the trigger at that time. We started not as an e-commerce platform. We started as a coupon book business, which pivoted various times to eventually become an e-commerce business, which, which then is now known as Snapdeal. Uh, but like the journey of any entrepreneur, our journey was also non-linear. Most entrepreneurs don't end up building businesses that they started. And that was the same, same for us. You started at a time when I think there were hardly 2 million active yeah, internet, internet users. Right. users. Right. Now you have over 1 billion. You've actually seen the ecosystem evolve. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, uh, if anyone told us back in 2007 when we started that mm -hmm. India one day will have a billion internet users, we would just not know, right? You could never, never say that, that would, something like that would happen or you would have um, tens of billions of digital transactions happening over something that eventually came to be known as UPI. Yeah. So there was no digital infrastructure at the earliest stages. We never got overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenges. I think that, that helped us get past all the naysaying that was going on. I remember in the early days. When we started our business, just the whole concept of entrepreneurship in itself was a very alien concept. Most people, I remember in my college said, Ke, iski job nahi lagi hogi. so he, sta <laughs> he started his company. That's how people used to view entrepreneurship because in a batch of you know thousands of people, maybe five people, seven people would go down this path. Plus, how do you explain e-commerce? No one had yeah. heard about no it. No one had heard about e-commerce. No one had heard about entrepreneurship. And because the period in which we built our business, um, there's actually nothing known as a startup, right? The, you either did a job or you ran a business. This startup, which is part of our like national parlance now, is only a 2015-16 phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And we always felt, Neha, that if ever in that micro chance, we got some amount of success in our own entrepreneurial journey, then we must pay it forward. Because the amount of pain that we went through in the early days yeah. with no mentorship, no support, very limited capital, uh, and a lot of chase and running around for the little capital that we actually got. So tell me about the first check you got. I think it was from Nexus Venture Partners, right? Actually, the first check we got was from an angel investor who was um, senior alum of my college and I got to know him because he came for a guest lecture at my college and then coincidentally I got a job at Microsoft and he was a Microsoft retiree from the very early days of Microsoft and I remember in the parking lot in my penultimate day in Seattle when I was about to catch my flight back to India I he asked me uh, what are you going to do I said well you know my my close friend from school, we are going to start a coupon book company. He didn't even ask any more questions. He just said something simple. He said, well, I'd like to support you guys. I remember the conversation after that. So he came back and, you know, Rohit, he said he'd like to support us. <laughs> what does that mean? So clueless we were. What, uh, what so, does that mean? So clueless, clueless <laughs> we were about, you know, funding and the world of funding and that you need actually money to run a business. <laughs> And then we got on the phone with him and he said, you know, I'd like to invest $200,000 in the company. 
back then i remember the dollar was 39 rupees yeah, 39 40 rupees so it was 80 lakhs again both of us had a discussion what will we do with 80 lakhs <laughs> so we actually said no we yeah. want only 40 which is more than enough <laughs> yeah. so that's how we ended up raising raising 100000 dollars as our first investment so what were the important turning points where you actually felt that a you will need more than 40 lakhs <laughs> <laughs> and b that you can actually aspire to be one of the big companies in the country i don't think we ever had such milestones of um, large scale domination or anything i don't think we had any such grand plans we've always been of the mindset of hey let's take a day at a time uh, let's put one foot ahead of the other and not try and get too carried away or get too ahead of ourselves there's a fine line between conviction and stubbornness and transcending and and you know sort of figuring out where that line stands is actually very important we never said hey in 5 years or 10 years we'll get to this point we're like hey let's just build when you building sort of every 6 months at a time or one year at a time over a period of time things become big also but you are never starting off saying that okay i need to be build something big you're always thinking okay what i'm planning to do in the next 6 months to one year mm -hmm. is you know a small multiple bigger than where i am today so i think that gradually grows if your business is big then next year what you want to do is slightly bigger than that and sort of your ambition grows accordingly you had some of the most storied investors on the board at snapdeal what did it take for them to come on board um, now given we are pretty active investors ourselves so we can put ourselves a little bit in their shoes as well see investors primarily look for three main things one quality of the team second um, the size of the opportunity mm -hmm. and third the ability for a business to generate substantial economics that make it attractive like ability to generate a profit in in due course not today necessarily i would assume so that they they saw the same things <laughs> or they were at least looking for the same things there weren't that many companies to invest in either uh, there were actually much fewer candidates for investment as well compared to now when the ecosystem is far more vibrant so fundraising was easy at that point no <laughs> <laughs> i think if there are fewer number of companies a fraction of investors yeah i remember for uh, our first fundraise we met somewhere between 23 and 27 people over a multi month period before we could raise even even the first vc round so fundraising was far from being easy because while the number of companies were far fewer the venture ecosystem or the investment ecosystem was close to non-existent because you know no one had seen success it was very hard but having been founders for such a long period of time and also investors for such a long period of time surely it is 10x easier now than it was uh, 12 years ago does this explain the exuberance in the market there seems to be some sort of a fear of missing out we have seen so many of these cycles now near at least 3 4 cycles we've seen as uh, operators and investors almost every exuberant cycle is followed with a passive cycle which is followed <laughs> with an exuberant cycle we build businesses across cycles and we invest across cycles because fortunes are not built or large institutions are not built within a cycle you just got lucky if you did that but you can't time cycles and the other thing we've seen is you know look the fundamentals of any business rarely change basis the market we as investors as well as operators have always been very close to the fundamentals of running any business i think what changes with markets is the perception of people in terms of whether to you know value this type of business very highly or very low which doesn't necessarily change the underlying business in any way what we tell ourselves and the founders we partner with that don't conflate value and valuation they may be the same but they may be very very disjointed from each other the value in the business may not be equal to the valuation you can't focus on the valuation because that's something someone else to, has to ascertain the price it's very important for entrepreneurs to be focused on building value in the business as long as you're building value long term valuation will take care of itself you know we've been entrepreneurs for 16 years we've been investors for you know more than 12 years we have incredibly long term orientation and we have this you know outlast everyone type of mentality as founders uh, what do you think were some mistakes that you made uh, during your journey that gives you that additional sharp insight as an investor 
founders generally make more mistakes than good decisions but thankfully you know as long as you make enough good decisions you can make up for the mistakes at the earliest stages of a business one of the most crucial things and this probably endures for a long long time in any business is the importance of focus where often times founders will say hey let me pursue three different things let me see which one will work and then i'll double down on that one yeah we have rarely seen that approach work and honestly in the earliest stages of our business we were also doing five things mm-hmm. you had free charge and a couple of other businesses Many, and i think in hindsight one realizes the importance of focus and discipline because in the earliest stages of a business you have very limited resources limited people limited capital limited time and you'd rather magnify all that energy and resources onto one thing and try and make that work really really well mm-hmm. if there is one enduring lesson of entrepreneurship it would be that at least from my perspective i think our first year was very formative in a very interesting ways we started with the coupon booklet as a business and it was just me and kunal and you know we sort of we saw this concept in the us which seemed very interesting and very relevant for india so we created this coupon booklet where there were a lot of coupons from restaurants salons etc etc uh, both of us spent one year building that product and by the end of it we had put so much effort into building the product that both of us became so convinced that this is going to be a super hit product without talking to a single customer by the way just to clarify we were so convinced that we were sure that the day we start selling these coupon booklets we'll run out of stock very quickly and so to make sure we don't run out of stock we printed 50000 booklets <laughs> of the first lot we knew that there'll be a queue outside our office when we start selling them or we were convinced uh, uh, we were convinced that there'll be a queue outside our mm. office in the first 6 weeks we sold 7 out of those 50 50000 uh, and that was a big lesson for us talking to your customers getting real customer feedback from very very early on in the business is uh, at least from my perspective one of the biggest lessons we've learned so you were just telling us how bootstrapped you were how do investors come into play investors play a very very crucial role we were very green when we started there were total of i think 10 venture capitalists all in india and in that context you want someone in the room who has seen some of these journeys play out before whether they, those worked or not where they funded other companies or they built companies of their own where they can at least guide us as to what to expect in this arc of building this business from zero to a certain point in time how to build an organization how to raise capital how to think about strategy how to think about uh, reducing the number of things to do as well as expanding in certain areas it was immensely helpful that said the business has to be built by the founders the investors can only provide inputs and guidance in the end all the important decisions have to be taken on a day to day basis by the founders that's one of the things that uh, smart and wise investors understand really really well you know they have a great ability to be great sounding boards for entrepreneurs without necessarily making the founder feel like they are running the business or they are sort of they are getting directions from the investor that's the worst place to be as an investor when the founder start feeling that actually they they own the business i am just running it for them that happens quite often though doesn't it very it happens very often it happened at snap deal no not necessarily <laughs> i don't think it happened with us i i i won't think so we've always had good set of investors where they at the right time they were always available i think the other thing we've seen is uh and i mean that entrepreneurs also have to remember uh that it is their business and they are they are in the driver seat they are the management and team which is running the and operating the business is it a wise decision to take so much money from venture capital funds or private equity funds when you end up diluting equity which in turn means you are diluting ownership in the company as well and of course you lose some management control yeah it's a it's a very good question and there is no right or wrong answer uh, because obviously a lot of people have done it like mark zuckerberg or jeff bezos they raised a lot of money and in the end they owned 15 20% of their companies it's not like they were also owned 80% of their companies vast majority of businesses that we see around us were not built with venture capital in the traditional economy etc it's all a function of how quickly you want to build the business because of your own impatience or ambition or because the market opportunity is the window is open only for a short period of time before other people come in yeah 
So often times, why do founders raise a lot of money in the and front load a lot of capital raising? Because they want to move very fast. Now, if they were willing to move more patiently or give themselves a lot more time, they may need to front load less of the capital raise and raise lesser money over a longer periods of time in multiple intervals. And so dilution would keep going down over progressively. But not all spaces allow for you to build like that. Obviously, every founder would want to <laughs> own more of the company <laughs> if they could. Like, like with many, many important things in life, uh, we wish the answer was as black and white uh, as possible. But you know, I think the answer is always a different shade of grey. There are many, many pros, many cons, and every situation is very different. There are certain businesses which you can't accelerate even with the use of capital. And the only way to build them is to build patiently. There are certain other types of businesses where the opportunity is immense, but it is also time bound. And if you don't do it and move fast enough at a sort of at a certain stage in the business, then the opportunity will be gone. In hindsight, do you feel that Snapdeal's trajectory would have been very different had you accepted a merger with Flipkart, perhaps? You know this. Uh event is so far back that we actually spend like zero time thinking about it. At different points in time of any company, any organization's journey, there are different decisions that you have to take. Basis the facts available at that point in time. Yeah. And look, the future doesn't care about the past. At the end of the day, you have to keep moving forward and not keep looking in the rear view mirror because there are so many opportunities uh, ahead of us at all po points in time. And that's the sort of very progressive, positive approach we always have. Of course, uh, now it doesn't matter because Snapdeal has found a niche in the value segment. And yeah, and, and we are Atmanirbhar. We've not had to raise capital for seven years as a business. Not only that, Neha, like some things people didn't expect happened. For instance, we created a completely new business called Unicommerce, which is our software business, which is doing extremely well, highly profitable. It was sitting like a small software within Snapdeal. We took that out, created almost like a business around it. Now 5,000 of the leading brands and retailers in India, we're processing you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of transactions through Unicommerce. Then we uh, gave birth to another business from Snapdeal called Stilaro, which is our house of brands. Now it's running various brands that are leading in the categories that they play in. So, the most important thing for founders is to keep your head in the game. Even if the whole world is collapsing from everywhere on you and saying, you are dead, you are dead, you are dead. You are not dead if you are not dead. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to keep going. You just have to keep moving forward and opportunities will keep presenting themselves to you. Just keeping your head above water and most importantly, finding the courage to continue when you're at the bottom of the abyss is so critical. And by the way, we've seen the abyss so many times <laughs> in the last 16 years that we almost expect it to happen every few years. You debuted on ONDC as well. How was that response? How did the business do on that platform? Look, ONDC is still uh, is a very, very promising platform. Uh, everyone thinks of ONDC as the UPI of e-commerce. And, and hence, there is so much exuberance and excitement around that. We have been one of the earliest partners. It is still early days, but some of the early trends are actually encouraging. And I have to really commend the ONDC team at their, their own resilience. And I was actually going to say that while ONDC as a platform works, uh, with some, you know, like anything as early stage hiccups, what is really commendable is the resilience that the ONDC team has shown very, very entrepreneurial, learning every day in terms of what, what their initial plan was, things that worked, things that didn't work, how do we very quickly course correct and keep improving. I think given the trajectory we are seeing with the team and how they are operating ONDC, we are very sure that it will be a raging success. What they are building is harder than building what we built. See, we were in control of getting customers and getting supply. Yeah. On our, because all of it was aggregating on our platform. Mm. ONDC is a decentralized platform. They don't have any suppliers that they own. All the suppliers are actually on someone else's platform and all the customers are also not there. They are on someone else's platform. To be able to stitch together such a complicated network of supply and demand is absolutely non-trivial and it is incredible how much they've achieved in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So we are 
quite optimistic about ONDC's future and hence we've been one of the early partners. So what next for Snapdeal? Look, we are continuing to make very good progress in the company. Uh, the segment we operate in, which is the value segment, catering to value price merchandise in the lifestyle, lifestyle segment. Uh, we are making excellent progress. We have millions of people buying on the platform every month. And while the platform may not high amount of salience in the big cities, so people such as you and me may not see a lot of advertising, but we do have millions of customers in the small towns of, of India mm -hmm. who are looking for a differentiated platform where they can get high quality merchandise in the value price points that they're looking at. Looking and that's for. a extremely, extremely large market. It is, of yeah. course. And there are many large, very successful, established offline retailers in that segment from the likes of a Vishal Mega Mart to a V Mart to a Max, a Zudio, so on and so forth. The benefit for all of us who build businesses in India or invest in businesses in India is that we are such a heterogeneous market. We are not a homogeneous market like the West where everyone is more or less equally affluent and educated. The temptation is always to operate across segments. But for a company like ours, where we've had the discipline and focus to pick this segment, pick the way in which we build in this segment, which is with good economics, good margins, good quality, uh, with narrow price bands of the merchandise, uh, we're seeing good success in the business. And similarly, like I mentioned, our software business within our group is doing extremely well, right? We're growing at 40-50% a year and profitable last five years. Now we have Stellaro as well, which is our house of brands, which is very nascent. Uh, it started just eight, nine months back. Mm -hmm. It's already on a fantastic trajectory. It's already profitable, growing very rapidly. Uh, I think we are almost uh, growing by 10% month on month, uh, given it's early days in the business. So that's, the, I think it's not large enough yet, but uh, we can see all the kernels of it becoming a successful business. Our starting point has been Snapdeal, but we're not stopping there. We are going to keep building more businesses within the group. And now we have a very good track record of actually creating new businesses within the group, which are successful and profitable. So for Snapdeal, do you want to list it? Uh, you had applied for... Uh... Correct. I, look, obviously the market conditions changed dramatically for technology or new age companies after certain listings and market events. Mm -hmm. And also the war, Ukraine war didn't help. Um, it's, it'll continue to be a plan that's on the cards. And, but it's probably too early to comment because we are probably going to keep watching how the market evolves from here. What Do you also want to break even before you hit the markets? We are already profitable in most of our businesses. For break snap deal specifically? Yeah, we, we, are, we are almost there. I so think that'll happen far before. Yeah, but that'll happen far before, far, before before our, far before the market being ready for us to list. That would be what, one or two years? We'll see. I think it's too early to say. You know, we don't want to be the the operators or founders who keep keep giving timelines and missing them. When we give a timeline, we meet it. It just doesn't seem the market conditions are conducive, at least for the foreseeable future, for businesses like those to list in India. There are many companies like us waiting, uh, waiting at the line to say when is the right time, and I'm sure there'll be a right time. But there's no rush for us. We've been building our business for 16 years. We can build it for another 16. We have no problem. Titan Capital, a uh, fund that you started about, what, 10 years back? 12 now. 12, 12 yeah. years yeah. back. You have a ringside view of some of the most promising companies in the startup ecosystem. Tell me a bit about that. From the time you started, how has the ecosystem evolved? What do you feel when you interact with some of these founders? See, we got into investing primarily to only help founders. That was our starting point. Some of the earliest founders, we met them very serendipitously. I remember Bhavesh, who was the founder of Ola. I was at a conference, at a travel conference, pitching travel pro providers to list coupons on Snapdeal. And on the way out, you know, this young guy uh, wearing a backpack approached me saying, hey Kunal, I want to talk to you about my business. He showed me his, this app that he was building and I was like, the we don't have much money, but whatever we have, we're happy to <laughs> give you, right? And then I set up a call between yeah, and I, Bhavish I, and I, Yeah, I, Rohit. I spoke to Bhavish on the phone, not even VC, because there were no VCs back then. And I spoke to Kunal, look, whatever we can, we should invest, because it does seem, seem like he'll do something really nice. It's just so exhilarating, so amazing to see these journeys from the point where it's just like, uh, two guys or two girls and a PowerPoint and some like idea to eventually being a nationwide phenomenon 
where millions upon millions of people are using those products or services every single day. It's the ability to believe that that can happen, that that magic can happen with this person that you're meeting, who, where there is no factual evidence to say that it will happen with them. Yeah, there is no factual evidence. So how do you pick your winners? We are empathetic. We are good listeners. We are attentive. We are giving them the opportunity to just say everything they want to say about their business and then ask them once more, is there anything else left for you to say? Because a founder has so much bubbling inside of them, they want to let everything out. But in the earlier stages, it's largely the three things that we focus on, which is the quality of the team. Uh, have they demonstrated some amount of success in anything that they have done in their life? I think life? that's very important. We've seen that, you know, uh, because there is no business most of the times when we meet the teams. To be successful at anything in life requires a certain degree of grit. Yeah, I would say the, the second thing which is very important is just the, the size of opportunity. It should be, today, it should be a very narrow, focused part of the market that you're going after. However, if you're successful in that narrow sliver, it should present you the opportunity of expanding your addressable market. Mm -hmm. So today it has to be narrow, but needs to have the flexibility of becoming bigger in the future. And third, I would say, which is very critical is... Uh, and yeah. very unique to us also, yeah. is uh, a business's ability to generate economics. Because we are strongly of the view that if you are in business, changing the unit economics of a business very dramatically at a later point in time are extremely, extremely challenging. And almost, we've seen very few instances of company's ability to be to be able to do that and as a result from very early on uh, we both assess as well as guide founders to have a, a not only a product market fit but a product market economic fit in their business mm -hmm. and when we say unit economics it basically means the margin that you make post all the variable expenses that you have to incur to deliver that product or service it is not easy to do not easy to do at all, especially I'm sure when Bhavesh would have come to you with Ola's business model, it would be hard to decipher how they'll make money in the market. So what made you actually put in money? Well, while we may give you a lot of intellectual answers. To give me an honest <laughs> answer. <laughs> but, the, but the honest answer is really in the end the founder. Right? It's the spark in the founder that makes us tip over. Because there can be many academic reasons to say yes or no but there's usually one like the biggest reason to have conviction in whether to pull the trigger or not and whether to say yes or not is really some quality that you've seen in the founder the grit the passion some amount of adversity in their lives despite which they have pursued this and are seeing some early signs of progress and you can just feel it in your bones that this person is committed for the rest of their lives probably to make this business work. And I think it's at the end of the day, it boils down to our belief in another person's ability to figure it out. Eventually, that's <laughs> how investing works, yes. But you mentioned that you don't really have a concrete holding period. But that's because we are investing our own capital. So we're not running a classic fund with other people's capital where there is finite fund life and you have to return the money to the investors in the fund. Is just Rohit and I investing our capital so we can stay invested for 25 years if we want. And I think our mindset when we invest in a business is closer to that of an owner of the business than to of a person who's trading in the stock. Trading in the stock of a business. So we you know because we come in very early in a business, we almost sort of all our actions and sort of mindset is what would we do if we own the business? How would we build value? rather than trying to optimize for what looks good short term, what pushes the stock price up. We are a long enough period of time. As long as you build value, valuation will take care of itself. Sure. And you know, governance is a cornerstone of that. I mean, yeah. to build a big business, it starts with the small principles, the founding Absolutely. principles yeah. that a company wants to inculcate as part of its culture. Do you see that missing in many startups? I keep reading about toxic work culture. You spoke about customer feedback. Yeah. Now, take Ola Electric, for example. There are quality and safety issues these are big red flags. How do investors typically respond to these situations? Look, I can't comment on a specific company, but in general, we've seen, at least our assessment is, we've rarely seen uh, entrepreneurs 
not wanting to service their customers well. We generally see very high degree of intent. But that said, other things about starting a new business is that in the early days, there will always be change. Something which is as successful as UPI, even that had changed in the early days. Sometimes in the early days, things are a little bit more broken and it takes time to fix. More often than not seen that over a period of time, companies are able to fix it. The ones who are not able to do so, don't become as successful. Well, our job is not to go and institute or change the culture in a company or, um, you know, babysit the founders. That's not our, our role. Our role is to guide, share our experiences. And the moment we see some red flags or which may be inadvertent, it's not like the founder is intending to do something wrong, but they are just absolutely overburdened with work typically in the early days that they may be losing track of some part of their company. Sure. That's when we have to provide that external oversight and say, hey, look, you need to start doing monthly town halls with your team because it seems your team is getting a bit disenchanted or disconnected from the overall purpose because you're so engrossed in the day to day that you're unable to impart a broader vision for what the business is building. And that is your job as the founder. Nobody else will do it if you don't do it. An investor won't do it if you don't do it. Similarly, from a governance standpoint, for all the companies we invest in, we institute a mechanism of monthly uh, MISs where they have to send their monthly profit loss statements to our team to make sure that we know how the business is progressing and we can highlight to the founder that, hey, seems like you're veering in the wrong direction and hence we need to course correct quickly. But the most important thing is actually culture, I would say. The thing that we really pride ourselves in terms of what we've been able to build in our businesses, uh, you know, the average tenure of a team member in our company is more than five years. That's an eternity in the startup ecosystem. And we try and impart some of our learnings of how to build a good culture through better communication, transparency, trust, with team members, uh, with also all the founders. Tell me your personal picks. If you are to pick one budding startup entrepreneur, who would you pick? No, you I, go first. <laughs> you know, like it's it's like asking a parent to pick their favorite child. When we invest in a company, all founders are our favorites. That's a very, very diplomatic answer. It is not. Trust me, it is not diplomatic at all. At different points in time, there may have been different. Maybe the, the answer is different. It is truly impossible to pick. Counterintuitively, Neha, we end up spending more time with the founders who are struggling to get off the ground. That is probably a bigger area of focus than, than actually the ones that are successful. You've been founders, now you're investor. You have shared your personal experience as well about how it perhaps took a hit when it comes to health. How have you now learned to kind of keep the balance? We have a lot of responsibilities and the buck stops at us for so many things in the end and that can put a lot of pressure on you. It can take a toll on your mind. And I think uh, entrepreneurship and the stresses of work can really take a toll on your health. Uh, but over the last few years, at least I've taken that much more uh, seriously. Um, the three things that really matter are, you know, good health, good relationship with your family and have freedom of pursuit, right? Just freedom to do what you want to do. And the combination of these three will give you happiness. This Balance is so important in life. Sometimes it's hard to see when you're in the moment, but you do realize that if you want to keep doing it over a long period of time, is if you invest the time and energy in keeping yourself both happy as well as healthy, by just having great relationships and sort of good health. My final question, you spoke about pressures and you spoke about the importance of relationships. It becomes very difficult, you know, you have the pressures of investors, there's the media, there's so much of noise. Against all of this, how have you kept your friendship intact? There are so many friends turned co-founders who aren't friends anymore, who aren't business partners anymore. And you were telling me it's 25 years strong. So what keeps the friendship intact despite the ups and downs in the business maybe? At the foundation, we have an immense amount of trust and respect for each other. The other thing which we've done, which has worked very well for us is in some ways, we sort of let go of our personal egos and sort of converted it into a joint ego of sort, sorts. That <laughs> joint ego. <laughs> I haven't heard that before. <laughs> so, that if you are successful, you'll be successful together. If you're not successful, you'll right. not be successful together. And personal victories don't matter. 
uh, the only victories that matter are the joint ones. You know, in addition to all the things Rohit said, I would echo all of that. But, you know, at some level, we don't try and prove to each other who is smarter or who is more intelligent or who is harder working. Or We are not in that. We are not in that game. We are not trying to prove anything to each other. Both of us are immensely proven to each other. There is no question, there is no paranoia. We just say things without worrying too much about, hey, w- will the other person mind? Will the person take it personally, etc. Because the other person knows it's never going to be meant that way. Sure. Right. Being co-founders and friends actually uh, pushes us to work even harder. Because when we're trying to do something, it's not only if we don't do a good job, it's not only letting ourselves down, it's letting the both of us down. <laughs> So I think that subtle additional pressure actually helps you to perform even better. Yeah, so it's sort of like someone described it nicely. It's like, you guys are two bodies, one soul. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, uh, let's wrap this conversation. It was great speaking with both of you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Nia. It was a pleasure. Thanks.